show up at this guy's house four o'clock right and i'm all like hey you know knock on the door and he answers the door and he's kind of doesn't look that happy hey i'm matt i'm with your insurance company i'm here to take a look at your where have you been he's like looking at his watch it's like you were supposed to be here at nine o'clock and i was like what no i mean i've got it down here as a four and i'm like looking at it going wait a minute oh no i'm so sorry because i you know when i organized my schedule i slid that one into the four slot instead of into the nines at the beginning he would have been, I would, he would have been done in the morning this claim just it was like every possible bad thing that could happen did right so i'm like listen i'm so sorry you know i i will we can reschedule for absolutely any time that you want to you know uh tomorrow morning first thing whatever he's like no no, no you're here now let's do this and i, I like look i could see into his house and behind him, there's a bunch of little kids running around, party hats on. Oh. It's like his kids, like, oh. fifth birthday party. Some of the neighbors are over, you know, there's some cars in the driveway, and there's a grills going, and people are standing on the back deck out there. I can see him, you know, having cocktails or whatever. And I was like, I'm sorry. And it looks like you're in a party. I, I, I don't want to. He's like, no, no, come on, right? And so he's like, I'm like, okay, you know, I got my clipboard and holding it up as a shield. How to learn to be a desk adjuster. How do you learn to be a desk adjuster? Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by desk adjuster. And I think that there are a number of... Lots of roles. <clears throat> yeah. So I think the in broad, the broadest terms, a desk adjuster is somebody who doesn't work in the field. And they may handle one or more other part of the claims process and that could be that they take photo and scope or just photos you know in some cases write a scope write an estimate and then hand that off to somebody else they may uh be a file reviewer you know like a, so a, a desk adjuster a, a desk job i can i should say could be a file examiner file reviewer it could be you know you could be a manager right it's uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of lump all that under like remote work. Um, but that being said, are there desk adjusting roles where you go sit in an office somewhere that you know of? Because you were, you did a bunch of cat stuff this year. So yeah, there is. Um, so there is the opportunities on both sides on auto and on, on property and what your role is. Um, as a desk, quote unquote, desk adjuster can be different. Okay. You could be a desk estimator. Okay. Yeah. Where somebody else's photo and scoped it, sent it in. You look at that and you estimate it, you determine total loss or not, and then you send it on to somebody else to finish it out. Okay. Right. To finish up the rest of it, that they're just going to do the, the settlement and, and, and the rest of it. That, that's what happens on the auto side. So there's like three stages in that. Um, on the property side, You'll have a desk adjuster who does exactly the same thing that somebody in the field does with virtual assist now and some of the apps that they have where, you know, it's a small loss. It's um, it's minor. Um, they just have the homeowner. They, they'll send the, the homeowner an app, okay? And it's basically, you know, like you have the virtual assist guy who goes out and he documents everything and and he takes pictures and then he gets the adjuster on the phone and and walks around and the adjuster looks at everything through his phone you know while yeah. he shows it yeah. to them and they can snap photos well they do the same thing but they just have the, the homeowner do it and uh, they're not going to ask the homeowner to get on the roof and walk around with the camera or something like that but if it's a water damage or something like that they can have them to step it off and estimate it by them stepping it off yep. uh, actually taking measurements and they'll just look at the damage through the lens of the insurance phone and snap photos as they need. Okay, hold it here. And then boom, they'll capture an image yep. and they'll settle it that way. And that's what a desk adjuster will do there. They do that for cat. They do that for dailies. They do that for everything. Okay. On the, on the, on a cat deployment, um, like in the situation I was under, uh, you had, you would sometimes be what they call the file owner or the claim owner the CO, um, or you would be working with an inside adjuster, a desk adjuster who was the CO, and you were just a guy in the field that was doing the photoscope and estimate. And, right, the eyes and, of the of Right, the and if it was, uh, and you would close everything in the field, I mean, you'd, you'd cut the check, you'd settle the loss in the field, 
and then everything else supplement wise or or content ale the inside person would handle uh, if they were the if they were the quote unquote uh, claim owner on it so they would they would do that part of it they would handle that part so there's different aspects on the property side as well on on what you do as a desk adjuster and there's lots of opportunities out there um you know i'm just going to go with the experience that i have and in the in things i have firsthand knowledge on um because of the nature of weather and and that need you know it has peaks and valleys in it the large companies depend on independents coming in the ia firms bringing them in people to work during those peak times okay they're not necessarily wanting to hire more field people they just say this is going to temporary rise they contact an IA firm they fill however many slots they need uh, to handle the volume and that work might be two weeks it might be three weeks it might be six months okay i know a guy right now he's sitting on a quote-unquote temporary desk assignment for he's going on his seventh month yeah. on it he was brought in during a peak time and then they just keep finding him more stuff to do and so um that's very common that's been, that has yeah. been common for years for me so that's what uh so that's far as becoming a desk adjuster you know contact your IA firms tell them that you're interested in desk adjusting it's really no different than being a field adjuster it's just you're doing everything at the desk you still have the same responsibilities for the most part uh it's just you're not out there sweating and yeah. you know burning your gas and everything else and it's you know hey if you like being tied to a desk and that's your gig <laughs> you know man go do it i mean right. yeah there's yeah. some people that that's just not their thing you know they just don't want to be tied to a desk they don't want to um, be locked down and they enjoy their freedoms and in, in planning their days so yeah i think um these are kind of interesting times because it's with with uh, all this new technology that we have the ability to um i mean literally in general this is an amazing time to be alive this little gadget right here this phone has the ability you can you can do a video call with a person on the other side of the planet okay. right now for almost for free just yep. get on wi-fi yep. right what other time in human history have we been able to do that kind of thing right i think you know when the uh the carriers have obstacles and they have things you know that they that they need to overcome in the claims process and, and they they primarily revolve around cycle time mm -hmm. and customer service which are tied together of course um and when they they have to, to to dedicate resources, especially to small claims, then then they have to have more people because there's all there's a lot of small claims, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about photo inspections or photo scopes or virtual assist on the IA side, I have got news for all the IAs out there that complain about this. The carriers already do it right on on the inside when i was a staff adjuster four years ago i was told and they trained us in that four month training you know part of it was listen if you can facetime with the insured on a small loss or listen i mean even if it's a larger loss and you don't have to go out there you don't have to jump in the car and put miles on your fleet vehicle and spend you know use the gas card and do this that and the other thing and, and you know whatever do it right have them pace off the the room have them walk around and you can take screen grabs from their thing or have them send you text you pictures whatever it is the reason why they do that again is because it's faster you're going to get a check in the insurance hand a lot faster way faster yep. weeks days faster at least um it probably is going to be wrong yep. but they have money in their hand and there's an expectation there that there's, you know, once your contractor gets involved, then we can kind of get this thing ironed out. But we want to get you started with some money right now based on what we can see from what this is. When you get yeah, a contractor there, then they can dig in if they find more, if it's higher or whatever, right? So that's kind of the kind of the way they play it. Plus, the the a lot of people don't want to have a adjuster come to their house. Right. Right. These days. A lot of yeah, the we talk about the millennials, yeah. You know, they they just want to do all everything in the app. Yep. Right. And they're the, they're the upcoming generation, right? They're just starting to buy houses now. And, you know, I mean, it's plenty of people 
our age own houses and we want to have a guy there that we can shake his hand look him in the eye and have him make decisions write us a check and be all done with it right there on the spot right and have that in our like skip all the mailing and the the you know the wire transfer the ach or whatever it is you know to get the money super convenient but a lot of times guy just wants to see a check in his hand along with the printed copy of the estimate right Right. kind of it's kind of old school you know facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience jeopardizing your years of hard work and success if you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster you're putting yourself at great financial risk if you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage it doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. But the new school is, everything is, digital right so all that being said the carriers are going to do it anyway and they're going to experiment with ways to make that work so that they could increase their quality the technical accuracy of their claim then maybe they they're starting to use hover.to right they're starting to use matterport and things like that the new iphone 12s have lidar scanners in them so they can get measurements and things like that you know and you can use matterport on your iphone with the lidar scanner whereas Last or earlier this year, in order to have a LIDAR scanner, this may not be totally true, but you know, through Matterport, it was like a $15,000 like a piece of equipment, mm-hmm. right? So if people, if they can get an accurate measurement of a room by having the insured spin in a circle with their phone up, right? They're going to do it. Right. Absolutely. Because that's one of the, one of the limiting factors of doing claims is getting accurate, as, getting accurate measurements when it's all said and done. Did we get an accurate scope of the house, right. accurate measurements and everything? So when they hand things off to the IA firms to handle, to help them handle claims, um, there's a lot of companies called TPAs, yep. third party administrators. I'm not sure I get the difference between an IA firm and a TPA because I was told that a TPA is basically a company that insurance company the insurance company sends claims to the tpa does everything on the claim and then turns back in the completed whatever right as an ia firm i feel like that's what i was doing already and i, I don't know anyway that's a probably another whole other discussion but they're going to try to bring that to, on the ia side they're going to try to take advantage of some of that technology so they're going to try we're, the, and we see it now right when, when we talk about these big cats this summer they're trying to find different ways, experimenting with different ways, different combinations of doing this. Do we send out a, a, a guy in the field? Maybe the, we give it to the contractor. And he holds up his phone on a video conference call with the desk adjuster and, you know, 500 miles away, whatever it is. And with a, on a, and you can, you can talk to each other. I've done this. Right. I've, I've done both sides of it, right? So you can talk to the person on the video call. You hold your phone up, point it at the house. And they say, okay, stand right there, for, hold for just a second. And they take a snapshot from the computer, the desk, right? Wherever they are, and then okay, now walk up to that front corner. I want to take a look at that gutter. Okay, yeah, a little closer. Okay, hold it right there. So you're basically just there. They are there. They're virtually. the tripod. You're a tripod, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so you're not really doing. You're not even doing a scope. You're just a photo. You're just a, right. a remote camera, right? And then I've done the other side of that, where I've been the one directing the person in the field. You know, these are big companies. They have probably tens of millions of dollars to, to throw at this this problem, and they're still trying to figure it out. So it's not like we're going to figure it out on this podcast. So one of the things that happened while I was on deployment, um, they told us, hey, utilize virtual assist. Yeah. If you've got one where I – mean, I cannot remember the name of – the service but it's basically put out by eagle view same company pictometry that uh that right after the storm they've got photos of the damage the the next day right like aerial right and so and you can zoom in pretty close on a lot of this stuff as well and so we can sit there and look at it and go yeah that fence is gone you know yeah that that uh that roof is gone if we've got previous claims we've got measurements 
you know. And so, therefore, there's really not a reason for me to go out and take a look at the roof and the fence because I've already got measurements. I can already see that it's down. I can get, you know, good approximate measurements based on previous claims or, you know, doing the, the measurements on the screen. We have some stuff that's going on inside the house or something on the side of the house. I mean, do virtual assist, you know, get that, get the photos from the inside of the house. If it's a lot, you know, it's like all the ceilings have collapsed and that sort of thing. Yeah, you might want to go out there. But if it's just a couple of water spots, a little bit of flooring, something like that, and just do virtual assist. Yeah. You know, and so here it is. I'm a field adjuster. Okay. And I'm not even going out to the house, you know. And so we were getting cross trained on both. Okay. That's, that's desk adjusting right there. Yeah. So now I've got the experience that I can take over and, and, and desk adjust if I want to. Um, so, but back to your point about, hey, this is something here to stay. And, you know, we're millennials are buying houses and, you know, this is technology going. The people who think that they're going to get rid of us with virtual assist. I can tell you a couple of reasons why it won't happen. Number one, there's always going to be old people. <laughs> right. Okay. And even though old people know how to use technology, that doesn't mean they want to. Okay. Yeah. The other thing is when you get out in rural America, okay, you don't have stable internet. Okay. Yeah. To be able to, it's coming, I'm sure. But as of right now, it's not there. Or there's just areas that just don't get coverage. Yeah. You know, it just, it's not going to happen. And then, of course, you still come down to those things that, Hey, you got a roof that's damaged, or you've got some other issues out there that you got to put eyes on it. A barn collapses, and you need to see the construction of that barn. Yeah, things like that. You've got to have people out there. I had claims that there was absolutely no way you could have done on a virtual assist. You know, oh, for sure. You know, and so they're always going to need us. Okay, they're always going to need people in the field. I don't see how they're ever going to get around that, until the fact is that they're sending in drones from way away that are flying around and going to the people's houses, and <laughs> it's just exactly they're, they're going to need us. So yeah, and, and that's that brings up a good point because we're talking about data collection only right on virtual assist desk adjuster. So you're basically you, the original role of the independent adjuster or staff adjuster or the adjuster period is now split into two, right? So you're collecting data, which is your scope, mm -hmm. and then somebody else is writing it up, writing an estimate based on that. The problem is, and I think that, you know, when we talk about internet and getting communications to remote areas, that's, we used to, we call that, used to call that the last mile problem. I have a telecommunications degree, so it's, right. um, when we get satellite internet, Elon Musk is working on it, so you know it's going right. to be pretty awesome, or not. Um, that's it's coming, right? It's a it's a last mile thing. It's I think it's inevitable. It's like electric cars are inevitable, right? Right. Um, it we still have the the human aspect of this kind of work, right? When people have a claim, they have a loss, mm -hmm. and you know, even on a small claim, right? If you have a water spot on the ceiling and it's somebody who's elderly or somebody who is um, needs extra help in some way, All right. showing up at their house, reassuring them, help walking them through the, the process, handing them some sheets and showing them, you know, sometimes a, a person to person face. It's why we go to the NACA convention. Right, because right. it's it's face to face. It's networking. It's face to face interviews. You can send emails out all you want to, and have a picture, uh, you know, a headshot or whatever. And it's just like I said, if it wasn't for good looks and personality, I couldn't have made it. Exactly. You know? and, and so can, you I have to see. see me to be able to appreciate that. That's why we're doing a video podcast. Exactly. So you can. If you have fires, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, regular claims that are not cat claims are fires, water loss, large water losses. You want to get out on site. And you want to meet with the contractor. What the this is like? It's like taking a balloon and like squeezing it, mm -hmm. right? It's going to pop out somewhere else, right? When you try to squeeze this side of it, it's going to pop out over there. So the, the what they're having is they're trying to save costs up, up front on the inspection and the data collection part by doing virtual assist. But then the balloon pops out the other side of their hand in a higher cost and litigation appraisal, those kinds of things where the virtual assist remote data collection part of the claim didn't do the, a good enough job. It didn't, it didn't fulfill the promise of the policy, which is to restore the person to pre-loss condition, right? It fell short in whatever way. Hail, 
it's a big one on this, you right. know, because even though there's technology out there that I've seen two years ago at NACA, guys were showing me technology that can using some kind of remote sensing infrared camera, what I don't even know how it works. They could pick out hail hits on roofs, like real hail damage on roofs. It, it looks different in the color. I don't know. It's, right. it's science. Uh, it's way over my head. So even in that case, there's still a subjective aspect to it, right? There's things that can trick that. And again, drones, not to go off on a big drone tangent, but there's a lot of limiting factors with drones, batteries. I mean, I know guys make it work, like mm-hmm. they do great with it. And whenever I say something about it, I get comments or I get a, a, a message or whatever saying, well, I've been doing drone stuff for you know, 27 months and I've made X number of dollars and blah, 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 and it's great. And great, and it's probably part of the future, but it's not, you don't go become like everybody can't go become a drone adjuster, right? Because you can't use them near airports. I mean, you can, but then you got to call air traffic control every time you want to fly right. it. You know, and so if you're in St. Louis, the airport's right in the middle of town, right? Chicago, same deal. Um, you can't fly it in a nas- in or near a national park. You can't fly it near military installations, right? And a lot of those, you go to Colorado Springs. There's like five bases there, right? There's San no Antonio. Way. San Antonio. There's no way you're flying worth. a drone anywhere near yeah. same Houston, Fort Sam Houston, or whatever. Right, so there's there's limiting factors to it. Um, so there's still a human element to it, right? If I if my house burns down or I have severe damage to my house where I can't live in it, I got to go stay in a hotel. I need to sit. Down, I need to have somebody sit down with me, right? right? And I think even millennials, it's going to be the same deal, right? You can't do a, do a FaceTime on right. half a burned down house. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster. But you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York. Makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. You can Technically, you can, but people are still people, millennials, just because they 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 grew up with technology that we could only dream of when we were kids in their hands, doesn't mean that they're not still just human beings, and they're going to grow up, and their you know their political views are going to change as they get older, and they're going to just like we do, just right. like we do, right? And it's always the life is a journey, right? The, th- the same things that we find important now as guys in our, I guess we're middle age, yeah. You know, I don't like to think of myself over the hill. We're not, no, we're still on, we're like on the top of the hill. I think I've top of the hill. <laughs> the things that are important to us are the things that are universally important to human beings at this time in our lives, right? And that means human connections are important, right? We want to have a relationship with our insurance company because we pay a lot of money for it, and I want to be able to, if I have a loss, know that this company is going to take care of me, so I can put it out of my mind, right? So, yep. and the gadgets and all that stuff, it's great. And I think it's going to become a, a part of the adjuster's toolkit, but you can't just, you can't get rid of the people. You're not going to, you know, we can't outsource claims to, to the Philippines or China or whatever. And at the same time, we talk about the human part of it. We talk about the interaction, you know, depending on the person and depending on the, the loss, the, the event that caused the loss, you know, the, for some people who have never had to deal with a claim or have never had to deal with any sort of 
for lack of a better term, adversity, that life has just been pretty rosy for them. And now they have something that's major happened to their home or their automobile or whatever, okay? And they've never had to deal with it. And you're sitting there now trying to explain to them via emails and over the phone and things like that. Yeah. And I will tell you right now that I've had to deal with, you know, being on the side of the business, I've had to deal with adjusters, you know, personally in my life. And there have been some adjusters I just want to reach through the phone and slap them because right. they had they were just so robotic. They're on the phone, they're dealing with so much volume and everything else, and they're showing no empathy whatsoever. And when you have somebody that's gone through that, it's not good. And I think the field adjuster, for the most part, okay, most of them have seen enough that they, they can be empathetic to that yeah. person, and it makes a big difference. And I think the insurance companies realize that at some point and know, hey, look, on these big losses, these big events, we have to put boots on the ground. We gotta get people out there. We gotta show them that we care. And, and back, track just a little bit more for the people who say that you know that the, they don't want to pay claims the first thing i heard was we need to get money in these people's hands as quickly as possible yeah do whatever you can to get these things done as quickly as possible even if you just have to give them an advance and you can justify an advance let's get them some money okay let's make them know that we care let them know that that we're working on their problem so they're not just sitting around wondering what's going to happen next you know yes and that's a big deal for these yeah. people to know and then some of them you hey look i can't get out there for this date is everything okay are your needs met i can look at this and get you an advance and they'll say we're fine but we really appreciate you offering that you know just yeah. just saying that to them and offering to come out and put them ahead means a lot to these people and then when you do get out there and you're explaining it to them and man they're they're happy that you're there versus over the phone and, I, and i've seen it over and over yeah and i and in addition to that the empathy part of it the the another limiting factor i think no matter if you're a millennial or you're a baby boomer or you're whoever um is when you explain things to people right when you have to explain the claims process and what the next steps are if you when you do that in person i talk about this all the time you got to be able to see people's body language mm -hmm. right because the, you know, over the phone this i mean and this this is just a fact when you're telling somebody when you're going through the estimate you know like recapping what the damages and what you're paying for and then you go through the claim summary page and you start tell, going through the totals and you start explaining depreciation and stuff the person on the other end of the line might be going uh-huh okay sure yeah right but if you saw them in person They'd have their hand, finger over their mouth, right? Right. And they'd have their, their arms crossed. They're trying to process. Crossed, and they'd be, they wouldn't be making eye contact with you. They might be looking at the floor, just looking at the numbers, and they just, they're, you know, they're not seeing, and it's a thousand yard stare into that. And they just want you to get out of their house. They hear that you're only paying for part of it, and then it shuts the rest of their brain off. Yep. And so they're just waiting for you to get out of their house so they can get on the phone and call their agent. Yep. Right? Exactly. So... If you're in person with them and you and you're l looking at that body line, you're watching them as you're explaining stuff. This is, I mean, it's, I think it's critical skill for an adjuster to have. You're explaining, all, especially the depreciation part, the two the two checks, all the questions that the concerns that everybody have. What if it's the contractor says it's more? What if this? What if that? What if you know we find more damage? Right. That's part of my spiel, but I'm watching them as I say these things so that I'm getting, you know, maybe they put their hands on their hips and look up at me and nod their head, right? All right. Okay, yeah, I, I, I think I get it. So, so I'm gonna get the first check now, and then when it's all done, so they repeat it back to you, right? Mm -hmm. I make them repeat it back to me. Whereas over the phone, they might say, okay, yeah, sure, that's fine. Yeah, uh-huh, uh -huh. yeah, okay, yeah, listen, I gotta go. And off the phone, and they're calling their agent, because right. they think they're not gonna get, they're gonna get half the money, right? It's just like the lady who had $25,000 in damage to her house. She had a lot of depreciation. She had a big deductible. Oh my gosh. You know, it's just like a $14 check is all I got left over. You know, she's losing it. And I did, and I, it was one of those deals where it was what I call my quitter claims, where somebody else had already gone out and done all the scoping and everything else. Right. And, and I took that and I packaged it and then I called the person up and she's upset and she's just not happy. And she hangs up the phone. A few minutes later, she calls me back. She's saying some very unbiblical words to me, you know, and, and then next thing you know, I'm checking my notes later. You know, I've got a message from the agent's office, you know, and, yep. and that's another thing. When you have a claim like that, okay, and you have one and you just don't feel like that, you know, you know, in that sort of scenario, that person's going to call their agent. You know that's oh, going to yeah, happen. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. 
I did try to reach out to the agent on that one right after. I left a message with the assistant, tried to explain to her, well, you just need to talk to him. Well, of course, the message didn't get to the agent. You know, uh, the agent's you office now is sitting there sending that. This thing's going up the ladder, you know. Yeah. The, up, everybody's upset, you know. Always try to reach out to the agent. Put a note in the system for the agent, you right. know. Whatever you think, you know, and explain what you've done because those people – and why? And why does this happen? And the reason, reason why it happened was because the person had an incomplete understanding. Right. They heard something that that they thought reinforced the conventional wisdom that the insurance company is trying to save money on my claim and drag out the process. Right. And then they sh- shut off their ears from that point forward. And so they were, that had that in my, in their head. For anything else that you say, you're just going blah, 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 blah. I blah, guarantee blah, you, blah, had blah, I blah. been in person with it, with her and explained it in person, read her body language, knowing how to, where to go next, you know, and making sure she was happy before I left. Yes. It would have been a lot better. Yes. Okay. Nodding and smiling is what you want to see when, you know, right. like, when, when you leave Versus the house. Versus I'm explaining it to her on the phone. She's just hearing a word. She has no connection to me whatsoever. She right. thinks I'm just this cold animal that just wants to harm her. Yes. And it, it's just not there. The more so. they try to, to, my point on all this is the more that they try to automate split claims. out this and automate claims and... And make it like you know it. Yeah, I mean, sure, it speeds up cycle time massively, but then you got a lot of back end work and phone calls to deal with, which still requires resources and people, right? Mm-hmm. The agents' phones are blowing up, right? And then the agents are calling the managers, and the managers and this person and that person on the desk. It's like it's the balloon. You're squeezing the balloon, and something's popping out somewhere else, right? So, long story short, I know we're just supposed to be talking about desk adjusting, All right? And, and we're, we're, we'll talk about desk adjusting. Well, this is part of it because this yeah. is why you're going to have desk adjusting opportunities. You're going to have field adjusting opportunities. And as a desk adjuster, you still have to know how to deal with these people, you know, and, and realize. Right. We deal with people. Right. right? Not just these people. It's, right. it's, it's not like, well, you know, problems. These claims. people is It's everybody. Insured. Yeah. So everybody's your customer, right? Um, so all that being said desk adjusting is a is can be a good gig i think you've got to like claims right because that's the that's the not as fun part Mm -hmm. as going out and scoping right doing photo inspections or photo and scope that's the fun part of the claims those are fun i'd do those all day long yeah you're outside right you're in the it's you get to you get to actually interact with people which is not on this job is nice i like this one of the things i like about this job is that i get to go and shake hands with people you know COVID notwithstanding right. and to get a little bit of rapport, get a little bit of like human interaction every day with a new person. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of fun, I think. And then there's, do you have challenge people that scowl at you when you show up? And by the time, you, you know, if it's a challenge to me to make that, that person smiling and like, thank you right. so much. You know, you really changed my attitude about insurance. They don't say that maybe necessarily, but they'll, I've had people say that. Yeah. You know, did you know that there is an adjuster school out there that has a full catastrophe property claims deployment simulation that you can sign up for for training? Let's talk about this. Veteran Adjusting School in Sedona, Arizona is just such a school. As a licensed vocational school, Veteran Adjusting School trains you to become a complete insurance adjuster. When you graduate from the Voss trained insurance adjuster program, you are ready to begin your exciting new career, whether as a daily adjuster or as a cat adjuster. Listen, there are many outstanding adjuster schools out there and you've got to get trained somewhere. Voss stands out among its peers for the depth and breadth of its program, which is a six week catastrophe deployment simulation complete with claims assignments, insured interactions, real damage that you can scope, as well as its continuing support and mentorship long after graduates become working adjusters, all of which provide a significant advantage to you. I mean, there's truly nothing else like it. Go to adjustertv.com slash VAS now and chat with an enrollment specialist who will answer all of your questions and help you decide if VAS is the right choice for you. Again, go to adjustertv.com slash VAS. It's your winning hearts one hearts and minds one at a time, I think. And it, insurance is something that is, it's so crazy for me to even like 20 years ago, if you'd asked me this, if I'd be having this conversation, be talking about how much I think insurance is a social good and everything, I would have laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. I love how we started off just talking about desk adjusting and we've gone, this, gone down this whole rabbit trail and hit yeah. so many different topics. It's kind of the reason why I wanted to do this. But um, yeah. 
one of the things I really love, and this is this should be a topic that we, um, or I think we're going to talk about it later. But what I love about field planes, there's a reason why I can't do desk adjusting for me personally, is I love meeting new dogs. <laughs> yep. You know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my life goal is to pet all the dogs, and uh, you get a great opportunity to do it when you're doing field claims. Yeah, for sure. And so. that's a, you know that's another that's another kind of a customer service yep. touch point because. How many times have you had somebody say, oh, my gosh, Fluffles never acts like this around other people, oh, yeah. other strangers. And you're, yeah. they're like, you know, you're scratching behind their ear and their tail and they're, and they're loving their you. And, yeah. But, of course, we've also had those dogs that they've never bit anybody, yeah, but they bit me. Yeah. <laughs> there's that. So, it's, so I still love that dog. Well, distance, you know, it makes distance. you wonder, like the first time I got bit, the I've been bit twice. Um the guy's like, ah, oh, don't mind them. Three little dogs, three little white, fluffy, I mean, little tiny, we have a tiny dog, so I'm not like making fun of tiny dogs. I would. And they were on the, out on the back porch at the, the, the sliding glass door, right? And then there was like little muddy nose prints up, like this high up uh-huh. off the, and they were just like, and their eyes were just like, you know, one was going that way and the other one was going that way and the teeth were all snaggled and they looked like little devils. Awesome. And he's like, ah, don't mind them. They, you know, they don't bother anybody. I stepped one foot out, slept, opened the door, stepped one foot out, and just crunched me right in the calf. And I was like, ah, you know. And the guy's like, they all, they, they all say the same thing you said. That the guy said yeah. the same. They didn't, no, they didn't bite you. No, oh, they, did they? No, that's no way. Yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, pulled paint leg up, and there's blood running down my calf. The second one, I'm in this guy's driveway. And he's got this beautiful Rhodesian Ridgeback. Love like, Rhodesians. Like a puppy. Yeah. Like a yearling, probably. So he, he. So he's good size of the year. Yeah. Yeah. And was acting weird, like kind of looking at you weird, and then like kind of walking off and sitting down, turning around and looking at you. And I was like, this is this. I don't know if this dog has been, hasn't been properly socialized or whatever. And kept trying to go around behind me. And this is a, a trick with dogs yep. if they try to go around behind you they're going to try and bite you yep. right so you have to always face them because they're never going to run straight up to you and try to bite you they'll always try to run around by, in my experience yep. so i wasn't paying attention because the dog wasn't acting aggressive or like barking or like acting it was just acting strange not like you know like it was wanting to come get me and so i'm standing there talking to the guy and the dog, i kind of the dog disappeared out of my attention span and next thing i know got nipped on the back of the calf again Yep. Like, ah, what the heck? Like, your dog just bit me. No, he didn't. Well, yes, he did. Take a look. <laughs> you know, Let me tell you what, a Rhodesian Ridgeback, I used to have one. Mm-hmm. They have some extremely strong jaws. Oh, yeah. I, he chewed the tires off a tractor. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Overnight. No lions to fight? Oh, yeah. He just took it out on the tractor. So So desk adjusting is 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 has is and has been a part of the job. For a long time. I mean, even back when I first got started, there were still adjusters who sat at a desk and wrote claims, right? They they might, you know, I don't know if we really did like a full photo and scope sort of thing. No, that's not true. We actually did. I know that there was on Hurricanes, Hurricane Ike, there was, they were doing a program where if you wanted to do flood claims, you could go out and scope and take photos and then bring it back and then somebody else would write it up. That's before... The phone, you know, that was 2008. I don't know when the iPhones came out, but um, nine or ten. Yeah. So even before then, they've been trying to do it. So it's not like it's, you know, and and uh, I don't know. They're always trying to find ways to to uh, save money on claims, but it's more in like like long term, like profit margin, or I should say overhead. Mm-hmm. Right. Overhead is having a building full of adjusters. Where you got to pay for the lights and coffee machines and water. Trying to save money on claim expense. Claim expense versus the claim itself, right. which I think is a pretty critical difference. So when there's these new opportunities that are coming out in the past few years where you can sit in your pajamas or, like I've done, sitting on the back of a sport fishing boat off the just off the coast of Grand Isle, Louisiana, which was super fun, with my laptop, my feet up, writing claims. Right, based yeah. on some other adjusters sending up, and it was it was contractors, roof sales guys that were going yeah. out and doing the. They would do a recorded one, mm-hmm. and then they'd upload it, 
and then I would write an estimate based on their photos and their scope and everything. And they'd send a, a scope sheet with measurements and the number of accessories on the roof and all this stuff. I think that was a terrible idea. Oh, I there's mean, no there's foxes no, in the hen house. Yeah, there's no room for shenanigans. They were all totaled. Every single roof was totaled. I imagine that. There was not one that wasn't. The, you know, no roof sales guy goes out and says, "Well, we didn't find anything on this one." At least in that program. Yep. So you can you can get this kind of a uh, kind of work, and I think it's it's more prevalent now because they're they they are experimenting with splitting up the claims role right the overall claims role which is going out and collecting data and then writing an estimate based on that data so they're splitting that up right so like you said like james said you call your ia firms i promise you they're all trying to build out some sort of a photo and scope program Mm -hmm. all virtual adjusting or virtual assist whatever you want to call it and they all the major ones anyway are trying to staff um, desk roles, file review roles, file examiner roles, QA roles, um, depending on how much experience you may or may not have, um, so that they can handle the stuff that comes in from the carriers, right? And I think you'll find at the beginning of the year, it's more common as they ramp up for storm season Mm -hmm. because they're going to get it's you know the stuff you see on the news is the hurricanes and occasionally you say oh we have it's super winter storm bob right which i think naming winter storms is stupid but that's just me hey, it's a weather channel thing yeah it's dumb um gale is going on right now gale oh yeah a, that's okay. what they want to call it, the nor'easter right now it's right. gale so there's all the storms that you don't see on the news that keep adjusters busy through the year right so the little hail storms that hit wherever the little wind storms the little sewer backup storms and those are those are little pop-up storms that happen all the time or they happen all the time during storm season which starts up in, in march ish right around march april right. and then it rolls through october so they ramp up i know that in, in years past like for example pilot catastrophe has you know offers a an inside position come to Mobile, come to Dallas, and work 712s or 710s or whatever it is for as long as we need you or as long as you can handle it or as long as you can, you know, hack it, whatever, and then you go from there on it. There's a lot of that stuff, and that's, I think that particular position was like you go into the office and you get a cubicle and you have a machine that you sit behind. Um, But there's also still plenty of remote stuff. And I think because the carriers are experimenting heavily with this stuff every year some new piece of technology comes out or gets better that makes it easier for them to do this the ia firms respond by trying to keep up with it right so any ia firm that says no virtual assist is you know it's destroying the business and we're not going to do it they've just destroyed themselves right right they're not going to they're not going to last because they're not going to get any work i mean i will say that there's with there are claims that virtual assist are perfect for oh, and yeah. there's claims that just they're not you know and i think as they gather this data and as they gather more experience with it they're going to be able to drill that down a little bit more to know better we should do this versus this you know yeah. and i think they're also have enough data as far as demographics of insured to know you know this is a good idea to attempt you know, virtual assist with this demographic right, of right. client versus this demographic of client. Just got just automatically know we got to go do it this way. I think they're going to get better at that. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I heard a conversation on that um, uh, here recently, and I and I that's what they're trying to do is to because if, the more data they gather, the more they can disseminate that information, the more they can take that and get better outcomes for you know customize the service that they give to each demographic within their their client base yeah. their policy holder base yep and and again those those big carriers they have a lot of resources for this and it's it is front and center mm-hmm. because you know if you, if you know anything about the insurance carrier business model there's a set profit margin yep. right and so they have to everything else has to kind of like expand or contract based on it, them making seven or eight percent or whatever it is right. um also especially at the top the top levels those companies are extremely competitive 
right? And they compete on customer service. So they've got it. This all has to be tempered with through the lens of customer, customer service. service and JD Power ratings, the MP, you know, MPS scores, all that stuff, touch point, whatever. Um, the you know, when they send out a survey to a homeowner after they have a claim, it's got like one question on it, maybe two. It's and the, the main question that they want to know is how likely are you to recommend X insurance company to your friends and family based on a scale on your of experience? Based upon your yeah, but yes. one to ten, and we only care about tens, nines, and tens, right? Yeah. Anything else is a zero. As if, yep. Hey, hey, Mr. Insured, how's it going? It's going great today. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. Right. This is actually Guy Grant from Veteran Adjusting School. So you want to learn claims from the most experienced veteran adjusters, but you can't find anybody who will let you ride along with them? Then let me tell you about Adjuster TV Plus. Developed by Adjuster TV and its industry partners, including the high-end training center of Veterans Adjusting School in Arizona, Adjuster TV Plus is a growing library of in-depth training videos created just for independent adjusters. Learn scoping and estimating from professional trainers and adjusters. Learn how to handle customer interactions with confidence. Learn the ins and outs of scoping and estimating exterior hail claims. And detailed videos about how to handle smoke, ice dam, water claims, and auto claims. Adjuster TV Plus also features the very best of three years of Adjuster TV's YouTube videos. Educational, entertaining, and inspiring. Come ride along with us on Adjuster TV Plus. So. Hey, my experience with customer service surveys from mm -hmm. previous previous careers, anything less than perfect score is failure. <laughs> yes. And that's not a joke. Oh, that's, yeah. That, totally it, it, your paycheck, live and dies. Live and dies by that. It by does. That, that survey. Even though it's something you couldn't have done, somebody else did, That's your you own that survey. So. And that is and that's a common complaint. Yep. Especially on the IA side, because you, as, a, as an independent adjuster, if you've never done this before, or you're just getting started on it, you're, those customer service surveys take you into consideration, and they, you'll see them, right? Yep. And they will base a customer service rating on that. Correct. And if the agent drops the ball, or if you got the claim second... Or if the call center, when they took the, in, you know, did the intake on the claim, was rude or they gave them a bad experience in some way, it doesn't matter. If in that, if that knocks the claim, the the customer score from a hundred or a ninety-five down to a seventy-five, you're getting a seventy-five, even if you gave a hundred, hundred and twenty, right. you know, worth of effort. So, one of the things, you know, back to the desk adjuster and you know, becoming a desk adjuster, if you like technology. Okay, you get to play with it first on the desk adjuster oh, yeah. side. You know, a, a lot of the stuff that goes on as far as technology in the industry goes, it trickles out to the field. Yeah. You know, the, the desk adjuster gets to see a lot of the cool stuff. I remember when we were at uh, Elevate last year, and a lot of the products that they had and they were working on, they, they already have them, you know, and you got to look at that, you know. Yeah. I would never see most of that stuff in the field. Most of that was for the, the desk adjuster guy, you know, that they were seeing. And I was just like going, it was really cool. You know, it was really cool to see how you could take all that data, you know, and some of it's big brotherish, you know, in a way. But at the same time, man, you have all that information at your fingertips. You have all that stuff that just auto that makes your job on that side of it so much faster yeah. and easier. Versus the guys in the field, man, you're still a, even though there's some automation that's happening in the field, you're still doing a, a lot of things the way you did it 15 years ago. Oh, you know? for sure. Yeah. And, and, and so that desk side of it is changing very quickly. You know, it is. Very, very quickly. I want to, I want to just do, do a little quick note about apps and software. A lot of IA firms are developing their own apps for field adjusters for the for the photo assist and the photo scope side of things. There are apps on you know currently that available that carriers use that they got off the shelf. Like I'm not going to name names. Subtle Assist. Um, <laughs> these are apps, and I'm, I'm I'll even have to call out Exactware a little bit on this. And this is just this is a software thing in general. Right. These applications 
and this is my limited understanding of how they're developed, but I think it's close. Somebody has something that they need a tool to do. Somebody who hasn't ever used a tool like that or done the role, right? So somebody in a a leadership or middle Mm -hmm. management or upper management says, all right, well, we need an app that does X, Y, and Z. We want to collect these data points, you know, during the claims process. And we want to do this, that, and the other thing. We want to have an app that does all that, right? And we're going to give it to the people who are in the field who have to use it. We're not going to ask those people any opinions about developing it. We might beta test it once yeah. it's like almost done and say, you know, tell us about how those features work or whatever. You're not taking it out in the field. You're not using it. When you guys develop, and this is my, this is, I'm just, what to be fair, this is my general complaint about software in general, right? right. The tools are, are requested by people who haven't done the job. And they're given to technicians who haven't done the job, and then they make us use it. Yep. Right. Yep. It's not a good model. This is, you know, people wonder why they still get garbage quality out of some of these, some of these platforms, some of these apps. It's because the person in the field, I have, this, I'm, I'm, I get a little emotional about this because this is as a workflow. I've got a claim person, right now. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, listen, the people in the field need to have prime input on how this stuff works. If you, if you take experience adjuster, let's just use this as an example. Everybody, anybody who's, who runs a company that has an app, you need to start from scratch and take adjusters who, who have worked a lot of claims and who are very efficient and say, help us build help us conceive and con- and build a piece of software that will make your job as fast and efficient and as, in- as easy as possible and still get all these other things that we, all these other policy initiatives, all these other strategic whatevers that the upper, uh, the, all the people at the top who let us do it is what I'm trying to say. I've got a claim right now. I've been working on it for two weeks. I went out to the insurance home. I used the company's app to do everything. Okay, yep. you take all the photos in the app. You do scope notes. You have scope sheets for everything. You have scope sheets for walls. You have scope sheets for floors. Yeah, and you go through, and it's all automated. You fill in the blanks. You're doing it all at the property, which means when you walk away, everything but the estimate's done. Okay. Yeah. But you have all the data you need to do your estimate, and then you draw your diag- and You do what you got. Anyway, the app failed. The app just absolutely failed. Yeah. It it uh, it didn't capture the photos the way I took the photos. So the way I'm looking at it through the lens of my and through my screen is not how the photo went into the system. It was more zoomed in, so I couldn't get my overview shots of rooms. And of course, I'm taking the photos as I'm going along. You know, and the and the deal is is to get in there, get the job done, and then get away from the get away from the homeowner and then go sit in your car and label your photos and, you know, upload everything. Well, I get out in the car and I see, and I'm looking at these photos and they're bad, you know, and that's not how I looked at them through my phone. Then I try to reach the homeowner. They're not answering their phone. I answering the text. And it's, it's kind of a weird area. I couldn't really knock on a door. And so I could only turn the claim in. Okay. And I sent a note up saying, Hey, this is crap. I realize that this is what we're dealing with. And I'm sending that to the desk adjuster going, let me know how to handle this. And so we've been dealing with this. Homeowner's not responsive. We can't get back out to the house. We finally talked to the homeowner. They want to take photos. Guess what? They've gone ghost up again. They've not taken the photos, done the instructions we've given them. And I'm getting hammered to close this claim, and I can't do it because the app failed. Yeah. Okay? But yet I'm the guy that's taking the brunt on this deal because somehow I failed in the process. You know? And, uh, and, so, that, and so, again, technology is a great thing, and I like it. You know, I'm a I'm a gadget nut. I'm a technology nut, but you know, when these things happen, there's got to be some safety net. Listen, you know, I, I mean, I, I I I'm not gonna sit here. It may sound like I'm I'm sitting here saying that this is like the thing that solves all problems, but I I I, do, I, I can't go that far with it. However, I will say that if you develop software that is 
instead of saying we need a tool to do all these things to collect all these data points to do this that and the other thing because you know we work on the 17th floor and have corner offices and and you know i've never met an insurance adjuster before even though they work at our company right if you make if you make applications and software and tools for people the claims process is not complicated nope okay i've said it before we're not we're not doing rocket surgery here this is not it's not advanced anything right it's drywall shingles you know talking to people and measuring rooms and that's it right what else is there right i mean some policy stuff and maybe you got to write some checks we don't need software that has all these other extra features because somebody at the top somewhere thinks that that's what we're supposed to have. So a bunch of guys sitting in the boardroom, what ifing things? How can we be more competitive? Well, what if we had a thing that did this and we collected when the adjusters out there in the field, we make them send out 12 emails to you know, to all these people, right? That'll make our some job some job some finance person somewhere easier, but it it creates a huge burden on yep. the person on the ground, right? As an independent adjuster, do you feel like you only have bad, expensive choices for health insurance plans? And when you have to use the insurance, you'll have to pay a lot out of pocket. Makes you wonder why you even have insurance in the first place. The stakes are high. Having no coverage puts you and your family at risk. It doesn't have to be this way. You want peace of mind with common sense health coverage you can count on that doesn't include things you don't need. You need real insurance with world-class protection from established carriers, not health sharing and not cobbled together prepaid medical. And you shouldn't have to wait for it. Get approved in days, not weeks. There is no risk and no cost to see if you qualify for these high quality plans. Not everybody will qualify, but you've got nothing to lose by getting a free consultation. Visit adjustertv.com slash health for more information and to apply. Let's think about it the other way, right? An adjuster has a job to do, right? It's, It's not a complicated job. Have a simple tool that literally walks the person using a very intuitive user interface and a user experience, whether it's on your computer, on an app, iPad, phone, whatever it is, walks them through and tells them what to do next. You may be for like the beginner, like express version. And then there's another, you know, I'm not going to get right. Listen, in other words, long story short, make it super simple and easy for a person to use. And maybe you'd save some money spending you know four months training somebody on your archaic systems from the 1987 right which is what they did to me at mm-hmm. the, at a carrier a, a top five carrier it was a dos like terminal interface what i had to get into like six pieces of software in order to close one claim in order to set up a claim i have six that is that's absolutely irresponsible on their part and they wonder why people quit Yep. They wonder why it costs so much to train people, and then they people quit, and they got to retrain more people. They spend, they spend millions and millions of dollars retraining people and training people that it could, that turnover is so high because the systems are, are garbage. Have one interface yep. that's simple and doesn't have all the things that you hardly ever use in it. It has the five things that we do all the time. That's it. Yep. Come on, come on. I have six apps on my phone right now that are claims apps for, for different companies that I, that I Which do work one's for. Which one's the best one? I'm not going to name names, okay? But there's one, it's so simple. And it's, as you said, as I go around and do what I'm doing, it tells me what to do next. Yeah. Take a picture of this, label it, you know? And guess what? They have a drop down because they know there's only so many photos that you're going to take and so many things it can be of, okay? It's drop down. What room is this, or what angle, or what elevation is this, and what is it on that elevation? Yeah. And it's just drop downs, like boom, boom, boom. You're going through it real fast. Versus others, you take the photos, okay, and as you take the photo, it doesn't allow you to stay within that. Once you take the photo to label that photo, you have to come out of the camera program, go to where the photos are, and then label the photo. Versus, I should be able to take the photo. This is one of the reasons why I'm having problems with that one claim. Had I been able to see the photo once it was taken mm-hmm. and then label it, I would have known it needs to be retaken. You know, let's put it this way. And so, it's, somebody somebody said, very very wise and sage person, another adjuster, 
said, made the observation, I could handwrite claims faster than I can use this technology. Right. I, if I take a photo with a, a Polaroid photo, it takes me how long to write down what it is on the little white part of the photo mm-hmm. and stick it in my pocket. Yep. It's done. It's labeled. Yep. Right. So technology is great if it's written properly. And again, it's you know, great. If it's, and I've it's beta useful. tested, I've beta tested some software, uh, two different ones. And the developer, the guy that you're working with and you're giving the feedback to, they're going, oh, the reason why you feel that way is you don't understand how it's supposed to work. You we, what you customer. don't understand is how it should work. Right. You're telling me how you intend it to work, but I'm telling you how it should yeah. work. Yeah. And you're not listening to me, the guy that's got to use it, and this is why you're going to, guess what? Both of those that I beta tested have never made it to market. Several years ago, about eight <laughs> years ago, I got the the wonderful uh, and very grateful for this opportunity to go um, and sit down with people, some folks at Xactware, the software developers, and we sat down with Xactimate, shoulder to shoulder, and I showed him this guy how I went through a claim because this this was right when twenty eight came came out and it was mm-hmm. people were complaining about it. He said twice, two times during that time, and he's taking notes the whole time. He goes, oh, we didn't intend for that feature to be used that way. But the, the simple truth is, is that these are tools that need to be made from the ground up from the person who's going to use the tool, their user experience. You guys could save so much money on training, retraining, you know, loot, hiring and firing people, you're recruiting and everything else. If you had tools that were simple and intuitive to use and they can still be powerful. Let's look at Apple. I mean, they're, the way they, they do things, it's the software does the main things that everybody does all the time and nothing else because it doesn't need to do anything. If you want to do like, if you want to like build custom, you know, like skins for your word processing, get a PC, right? And do, you get Excel or whatever. But if you want to just have a, uh, like a, a spreadsheet program where you're going to run some numbers and stuff, then the simplest thing is the simplest thing. Right. Right. I don't know. It's... I think sometimes I try to over engineer a stick. Yes. Yes. And you know what? And in fairness, I'll say this. There are a lot of things at play that are beyond us. Right. right. So for example, if if a carrier is gets a, a new CEO, right? That new CEO comes in, it's like getting a new president. They come in and they sweep out all these other people and they bring in their own new team and they, they, they run around, they reorganize everything and they set everything up to the new way for the new, the new man or woman who's going to run the show, right? And he may say or she may say, you know, look around, you know, have, have her, part of her team go and look around for a tool for um, a, a claims management system, a new CMS for them, right? In 1987, right? And that guy's a CEO, for 15 years they're not changing that cms in 15 years right they're just going to keep spending money on it they'll spend it may, maybe they do a proprietary custom one and they spend several hundred thousand dollars doing that they're going to keep that because they spend a lot of money on it and every year they spend more money on it they built their whole training programs around teaching people how to use that particular piece of software right and yet in 2017 20 years 30 years later it's not it's clunky and the company is like the only c- customer that that company has that makes that or maintains that software is this comp is the is this carrier you have that going on on the auto side it's every it's everywhere you know, all the time it's but you have, it's, a, you have but, a very big company that's that they updated their cms not that long ago right and it's it's like working it's almost a step above dos yeah so yeah. so in other words there's long story short of what i'm saying there is is basically that the, there's a, a enormous amount of the enormous number of obstacles to to switch to something new yeah. right there's and especially with carriers they're super slow moving they're very traditional very conservative and they're not gonna it works this way it's working we train all the people this way 
we it's the devil we know we run our metrics based on the productivity that we get out of people based on the system that we have if we try to change it then everything everybody freaks out right so it's hard to get them to change that stuff but, but they i think they have to i think it would solve a lot of problems i and i even said this in my exit interview i was like listen you guys you would be able to keep a whole lot more people attract more millennials to, into insurance you'd be able to keep more people if the systems that you guys ran were simple and power, powerful and simple and intuitive you would spend way, half the time training people on this stuff it's not complicated it's yeah. it's just not complicated but i thought you'd attract more millennials if you put a ping pong table in the employee lounge oh yeah have little you know razor scooters all over the place that would get wear more flip flops and, and skinny jeans to work yeah. so I do. Yeah, well, I'm wearing flip flops and now I'm not. I'm wearing skinny jeans. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you are definitely maybe stretchy jeans. <laughs> so I had this one. <clears throat> I had. Um, it was a sewer and drain backup storm. I can't remember where it was, but I had when I when I do my schedule, I print out all the loss reports. And I use that as like, I take notes on and then I transfer those into Xactimate. Once I've made all my contact calls or left messages or whatever, then I, that goes into, so anyway, <clears throat> I write in the upper right hand corner, the time and the day and the date in kind of shorthand and circle the time. If, if it's a confirmed appointment, I make a check mark on it. So that I can just at a glance say, okay, that one's confirmed, that one's confirmed. I, I got to call this guy back and make sure I can get it. right. So it's a, it's a super duper simple process. Um, but if I'm going too fast, like if and I'll lay all my my things out on on the bed, right, which is why I always make my bed in the hotel, and then I'll stack them and order them and however I want my schedule to be, and then I'll take those out and I'll say, all right, I'm gonna do this one at nine, I'm gonna do this one at eleven thirty, I'm gonna do this one at whenever. Sometimes my numbers look like other numbers. Like my nine looks like a four, my four looks like a nine if I'm going too fast. Yeah. Show up at this guy's house, four o'clock, right? And I'm all like, hey, you know, knock on the door and he answers the door and he's kind of doesn't look that happy. Hey, I'm Matt, I'm with your insurance company. I'm here to take a look at you. Where have you been? He's like looking at his watch. It's like, you were supposed to be here at nine o'clock. And I was like, what? No, I mean, I've got it down here as a four. And I'm like looking at it going, wait a minute. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Because, you know, when I organized my schedule, I slid that one into the four slot instead of into the nines at the beginning. He would have been, I would, he would have been done in the morning. This claim just, it was like every possible bad thing that could happen did. Right. So I'm like, listen, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I will, we can reschedule for absolutely any time that you want to, you know, uh, tomorrow morning, first thing, whatever. He's like, no, 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 you're here now. Let's do this. And I, I like look, I could see into his house and behind him, there's a bunch of little kids running around with party hats on. Oh. It's like his kids, like oh. fifth birthday party. Some of the neighbors are over, you know, there's some cars in the driveway and there's a grills going and people are standing on the back deck out there. I can see him, you know, having cocktails or whatever. And I was like, I'm sorry. And it looks like you're having a party. I, I, I don't want to. He's like, no, no, come on. Right. And so he's like. I'm like, okay, you know, I got my clipboard and holding it up as a shield. And we go downstairs into the basement, fully finished basement. And normally, when always, you get, you get on a sewer backup claim, I'm going to get the risk photo first. Um, probably going to get all four elevations. In this case, I was just getting a risk photo and then I would get the elevations later. Um, so I got to my risk photo. The next photo I take is the source of the water, right? That's all I want to know where the source is because when, when a file reviewer is looking at it or, the, or a QA or whoever, they want to see the source that tells you everything else that's going to happen in the claim, if it's going to be paid or not. And so I'm like, as I'm going down the stairs, he's in front of me and he takes a, a hard right at the bottom of the stairs. And as I'm coming down the stairs, I can see into the utility room. And usually the utility room doesn't have carpet in it and the floor drains in there or in the sump pump well, usually in right. there as well. He had a sewer and, back, sewer and drain backup endorsement on his, his policy. The regular homeowner's policy doesn't cover water that backs up through a sewer drain or a sump pump right. well, right? Right. Um, no policy, just to lay this out for everybody, no policy at all, at all ever, 
covers any water, any surface water or water below the ground that seeps through the walls, comes in through cracks, you know, as soon as it hits the ground, if it pours in through a window, I mean, it's, it's not covered, right? At all. There's, it's hard stop. There's no, it's a wall. You cannot, right. there's no way around it. Um, so I'm like, I, I'm looking in there and I, I see the floor drain. I don't see a sump pump well, but I see the floor drain and I'm like, he's going that way. And I'm like, so where did the water come in? Right. I'm like, as you know, I kind of turn and follow him off down the hall into the, the main living room. It's got a, it's like typical Midwest finished basement that was right. finished in 19. 19- 85. Right. So it's like some paneling and some shag carpet and a bar with shag tiki, carpet, tiki things on yeah. it. And, you know, it's, it's a typical, but there's a bunch of furniture and a TV on a, on a, you know, like a, a MDF TV stand. It's, right. it's standard issue Midwestern basement. Right. Finished basement. And he's like, he starts pointing at the, at the far wall. He's like, well, the water all came in under the wall right there behind the couch over there. And I was like, oh no. Oh, no. yeah. it's got the endorsement. I'm like six hours, whatever late, eight, nine, seven hours late. His kids, his kid. I mean, it's like, what else could possibly happen? This could happen, right? right? It could be not, it could be not a home run, easy claim, you know, cause I was looking, I was like, oh, he's got the endorsement. Right. But when I was upstairs, downstairs, he's like, you know, it, it came in from under the wall. It came in from, it was all wet over here. Right. And I was like, so I, what I did was, is what I always do in this case anyway. Uh, but in this case, I was like really, really hoping that it would turn out differently. What you do in that case or any case that you have a water coming into a basement of some kind is to, is to really, is to truly ascertain where the source actually is. I'm like, so is there any chance? So I was asking ask some questions. I start poking around other little closets and stuff. Do you have another, do you have some pump down here? Nope. No sump pump. Are you sure? He's like, I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure. You know, so we look in the little closets because sometimes there'll be a little like a, a one and a half by one and a half closet that only has a sump pump in it, right? He's like, no, no, we couldn't find one. There's no other floor drains. I'm like, is there any? Is you know, is it possible that the water came out of the, the floor drain here and went over there? He's like, no, it was bone dry in there. He insisted it was absolutely bone dry in there. And I'm like, you're positive. I mean, is there a chance that that Cause sometimes what happens is, is like, you know, like you go to a little old lady's house and she, the, the storm happens, the power goes off and her basement gets some water in it. And then the power comes back on and she's like, well, maybe I'll just do some, do the wash now or whatever. And so she opens up the door and turns on the light and looks downstairs and sees, you know, mm-hmm. Barbie doll heads and family photos floating by in the, in water in her basement. She has no idea where it came from. But she thinks because there's a wet spot in the corner that that's where it came from. She never went down in the basement to check. Right. She's got the endorsement. She's got a floor drain. She's got some pump. She no. There's no way to say one way or the other where it came from. Right. Right. So I'm saying it came from the floor drain because it probably came from the floor drain and not from the, the wet corner where you know. Right. It's just all. It, it's the simplest anyway. <laughs> so I, I want to try to find a way to give them benefit of the doubt. Is it, is it possible that I'm looking looking at the ceiling? You know, we, we will go upstairs and take a look. Did it come in through the to, through the roof and run down inside the wall? It's possible. You know, is there a way? And he starts to, to kind of get it. And thankfully, he was. It turns out he was a pretty chilled guy. Mm-hmm. He wasn't like just like, you know, a complete. You know, he was an, an angry person naturally. He starts. To, he's, he starts to it dawns on him that I might be trying to find a way to to cover it. And it's not going to maybe not be covered. And so he starts asking me that question. I'm like, well, I explained the policy to him, you know, and I'm like, listen, I, I have to give you the benefit of the doubt. So if there's any way that, you know, water came out of this drain right here, he didn't see it or, you know, what he's like, listen, he's like, I, I appreciate you doing that. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. He's like, it was, there was zero water in this room. Right. And I was like, Okay, well, I, we explored every possible thing. I was there for like 45 minutes right. trying to find a way to, to, to pay for this, and I couldn't pay for it. He's like, I really appreciate you trying. And I was like, listen, I am so sorry I was late. He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. You know what happens, yada, yada, yada. Come on upstairs and get a burger. You know, and I was like, I would love to, but I absolutely can't. And he's like, no, no, come on, come on. And I, I was like, I can't. Like, yeah. it's, it's the rules. Like, I can't. I, I really want to. It was the last claim of the day, right? I'm like, so... That was a situation where putting in even more extra effort on on a claim that mm-hmm. 
was looked like it wouldn't be covered to maybe see if that was actually true, which is one of the reasons why you don't deny claims over the phone because the person may not know, right? They may not, they may have opened the door and looked downstairs, saw water and made an assumption not based on any kind of reality. You get down there and you see that the, there's, you know, there's dirt streaks going into the floor drain. That's where the water came from. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, and if they didn't see where it came in anywhere else, it's not wet. There's no evidence that it got wet in that corner where the, 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 the wet spot is on the wall where she thought it came in. She just didn't go down there because she didn't want to get her feet wet. You have to give people the benefit of that, and you have to investigate the claim. That's, that's the job. The whole, the whole point of this story is turn a potential zero customer service right. experience into a 100. Guy sent a letter to his agent saying, we're disappointed. You know, It didn't get covered, but we really appreciate the job. Matt came out, and he, he, he put forth a lot of effort. He gave us a fair shake which is the best that you can hope for as an adjuster. Yeah. If you can't pay for it, if the customer says he gave us a fair shake, you're going to get a good customer service score. At least your part, they may you know, give a two for the whole thing, mm -hmm. but this is another reason why, and I'm going to toot my horn a little bit, I was the only person in the entire country for like a month that had a 100% customer service rating on uh, claims on CWPs, so not unpaid claims. So that was either they withdrew right. or they were denied, and there was a, there was a lot of the denials. One hundred, and I was getting calls from all kinds of emails and calls, and tell us what your secret is. I'm like, investigate the claim, investigate it, and communicate. <laughs> give them a yeah, and give them a fair shake. Communicate with them, and then do that. There's all the next step things they you know they they kind of came up with, but that you do anyway, right? especially for people who you, you can tell don't have the resources. You, you help them understand what they can do to not have mold grow in the house, to, to clean up all this wet stuff, to fix this, to fix that. You know, it's possible it could be deductible off their taxes as a, as a, un, you know, a denied insurance claim. Talk to your CPA, talk to H&R Block, right? That's a potential way. Keep track of all these things for that reason. And also maybe, you know, in, in certain cases, FEMA might, or the state might declare it as, a disaster area and say, we're going to give everybody a check, but you got to show that your expenses, you know, you have all the, the, the grandkids and everybody come over with bottles of Windex and formula 409 and paper towels, you make a list of everybody, how many hours they were there, how much was spent on supplies on Saturday, same thing on Sunday, same thing on whatever. If you had to go buy box fans or you rented some fans from Home Depot, keep all that stuff. So this, it's one of those things, write right. an estimate for them. I've done this a bunch of times. I say, you know, listen, there's, we can't pay for it. You know, you go through that whole thing. And then, but I want to be sure that you are, you know, when you, when you, when you go to pay somebody to, to do this, that they're in the ballpark and you can call me later if you have questions about it, or if you want to talk to about it, I always made myself fully available, but I'm going to write you an estimate based on what I can see is damaged and what I, what it should probably cost to do this work. And it's going to, you get a new opening statement in Xactimate that says, this is not, we're not paying right. this. This is for, for just for your information as a courtesy, right? Right. Print that out on site and give it to them. I'm doing that 100%. 100s. 100s. That's how you, You're awesome. this is the people person part of the job. absolutely awesome, Matt. That's one of my favorite parts of the job is running into that challenge and, and not crashing and burning. Because it, when I first started doing this, Back in the early days, I was terrible at customer service. I mean, I, I, if even if I was giving the insured everything that they wanted, if I wasn't, I, I discovered this very, very early on. If I wasn't confident in it, if I was like, well, I mean, it looks like the roof is probably gonna be this much, mm. da da da. They were wall right and then they didn't believe anything else i said after that are you new to the professional claims industry confused about exactly how to get started as an ia worried that the advice you're getting on social media might not be totally accurate then you need to check out ia path ia path helps adjusters get started in their new career in 90 days with online mentorship programs and training if you need help getting started or making a transition as an adjuster, head over to iapath.com slash adjuster TV for a free video course showing you how to get working in the next 90 days. That's iapath.com slash adjuster TV. 
Because if I was just like, you know, and again, the body language thing, if I have the, 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 the closed body language, the defensive body language, the unconfident body language, nobody's believing me right. at all. So. so I had this one. Yeah, let's hear it. So this was an auto claim. This is probably, I would have to rank it in at least my top five worst experiences mm. on a claim. So there's a lot of companies out there. So my experience so far on the property side is that the companies want to come in, they want to take care of you, they want to make you whole. Okay. On the auto side, there are none of the major companies that you hear about that you may see advertised on TV. No problems with those guys whatsoever. They want it. I mean, it's customer service for them. Yeah. They're wanting to take care of claims, want to make people happy. They want to avoid litigation. You know, they're, they're really trying to take care of claims. Yeah. But you have some of these very low-cost, high-risk carriers that they don't want to. They want you to write the lowest possible estimate. As a matter of fact, you will write an estimate based upon reality, and they will come back and tell you to cut your times back, repair times back. I mean, it's that bad. We well, don't do that on the property side of that ever. Right. Um, I've never had anybody kick my kick my estimate back and say, "No, you need to do less for that repair." You yeah. know, never happens on the auto side. Call this lady on the phone. Ends up that this thing has been kind of dragged out a little bit by the time I got by the time it got to me. The accident had happened weeks before and they're just now sending out an appraiser to look at the vehicle, which I was lucky enough to be me. She lives in a small town close to the small town I live in. It was about 20 minutes away. Call her, make the appointment. She's been a little difficult as far as pinning her down for a time. We finally come up with a time. She goes, I just want to tell you right now I'm not happy with your company. And she starts telling me, she goes, and I am going to have my attorney involved in this. And she's telling me all these things. I said, well, ma'am, let me explain to you. I'm an independent. My job is to come out and give you a fair, unbiased assessment of the vehicle and estimate of what it's going to cost to fix it just understand that if i can't see it i cannot put it on my estimate however when it goes to the shop and they find it and they can provide me proof that we don't have any problem adding it okay well you sound really nice but you're going to do whatever your employer tells you to do <laughs> and uh, or whoever and i said ma'am i'm not employed by them well whoever's putting money in your pocket is who you're going to listen to I'm you like, are, okay. ma'am. Yeah, so she's, <laughs> so she's just ready. She's loaded for bear already. Right. So I, I show up at her house. She's not there. I try to reach her. She doesn't answer. I'm like, I'm gonna give her the benefit of the doubt. She had to run somewhere. She had kids. We had to run somebody to school, gymnastics, whatever. We'll figure it out. I'm hanging out. I'm reaching out to the to the I firm. You know, making notes and everything else. I see her drive by. I'm. She's a little, kind of a busy little highway. I parked down the street at a, at a church, but I can see her house. I see her drive by, I see her park in the driveway. I zip down there, pull in the driveway behind her. She starts yelling at me about parking in her driveway. Oh, yeah. There's no other place to park right. except on the freeway, you know? And so, and there's a, like a ditch in front of her house. You know, there's just no place to go. I said, ma'am, I wanna be here 10 minutes. How can you be fair and impartial in 10 minutes? You know, right? Like okay. So I moved my truck. You know, her kids in the back seat of the car. Okay, I'm taking photos. I said, "Ma'am, would you mind having your child hide her face while I take these photos?" So I have to take some interior photos. You're not taking a photo of my daughter. I said, "Ma'am, this is what I'm trying to avoid. I don't want to put your daughter in the picture. I don't want to put her face in the picture. But I have to take a picture of the interior. The damages aren't on the inside." You know, and I haven't explained. Anyway, <laughs> argues with me about everything. Right. So number one is I have a very difficult claimant, okay? So this is a liability claim, okay? So she's been hit by somebody else. I've got a carrier who's just awful to begin with, and they've drugged their feet out this far, and she's just belligerent as can be when I get there. I write the thing up. You know, she had a custom hitch put on it, trailer hitch put on it. She had, she told me she paid X amount of dollars for it. Uh, she didn't have the receipt for it. I look it up online about what it would cost. Then lo and behold, she sends me a receipt. I add that to it, send it to the shop, gets to the shop, and she takes it to the one shop 
that will fluff every single claim. Ah, of course. And and just they're diff- and they will supplement every claim until you pay them. And of course, not only do I have a really bad carrier that wants to not pay everything, the adjuster on this one is the guy who will argue everything and tell you that you're crap, tell you that the, everybody else is crap, and that uh, ha- I've been up. in this business. I've been in this business for 15 years, and you've. I've never seen so much crap in my life. You know, this is that kind of guy. So I'm dealing with this thing. Long story short, <clears throat> a month later, I receive a supplement, you know, that is twice my original estimate. Okay. Contact the shop. I need photos. You know, if you need photos, you need to come out and take them yourself. Wow. Friendly customer service. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to be in your area tomorrow, as a matter of fact. I go by there. There's a certain amount that they were correct on, but they're, they're, they're just fabricating stuff. They're just making stuff up on the rest of it. And so I just tell them, no, this is what I can do. You can't do it, you know. And so I send up my report, okay. Now, remember, I've already denied probably half of what they're asking for. Right. I go add it in. I get a phone call from the adjuster. How much are they paying you to kick – how much are they kicking you back? What the heck? He's saying that they're kicking – he goes – I've never seen so much fluff in my life for that kind of damage. I said, sir, the, the photos are there. The measurements are there. You can see the measurements I took to show you that there's the bend. You know, we got to replace this. You know, we're basically rebuilding the back half of that car. You know, and uh, it was a Dodge Journey is what it was. And he says, well, now you need to change. You need to change all this to this you need to change your repair time to this you need to you need to take a deduction for this and, and you're not and i'm not paying to remove the front seats in it you know and which and i was like all right so i made all the changes per his instructions well in my notes i said went to shop blah 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 wrote estimate this much submitted it was told by the adjuster to change it to this you need to take that out of your report no. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not taking that out of my report. So I got deposed on this one um, last month. Jeez. It's gone. I mean, it's been a mess. The lady still hasn't got her car back because the shop is holding the car. Um, then I heard that they're trying to get the title on it, and it's just a uh, – oh, I, that's right. So the, it's like Wild West. It so the, claims. So the, the, the finance company went ahead and paid the shop – what they wanted okay and then tacked it onto the note of the vehicle oh my gosh because the, the, the shop sent a note to the shop sent a note to the um sent a letter a certified letter stating that they were claiming the vehicle put a lien on it and uh they were going to try to take possession of it so it, it's a mess God man and it's, uh, it's all because it just it was the perfect storm man it was like the worst client you could get the first the worst car right. owner the worst insurance company with the worst adjuster with the worst shop you know and then like i said i got oh, i finally got called in and got deposed on it and uh and i just said this was you know this is what happened on it you know? and they were they did surprisingly they didn't include me on a lawsuit um and, it, and what you. saved my rear end was making that note that said per the adjuster made changes per the adjuster's uh-huh. instructions yeah yeah you know and then whenever he called me and told me to change it i put a note in there received phone call from adjuster requesting you know changed refused and that's what saved my bacon boy yeah that's uh keep track of document every document everything every Always conversation works. i had with that insured and everything she said to me that was derogatory i put it in the notes okay Everything that adjuster said that was derogatory, I put it in the notes. I oh, put man. everything in the notes, you know, and uh, and bit my tongue every single time somebody made an attack towards me. Oh, yeah, because you know? it'll come back in court. Well, yeah. you said rah, rah, rah. Exactly. So you're going to get two, two to choose from right now. This is the perfect one for you. What do you call a guy... Who tells dad jokes but doesn't have kids? <laughs> what? What do you call a guy? What do you call that guy? A faux pas. Ah, hey. <laughs> 
If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV.